scripture, Proverbs, uh, Proverbs, and we'll be in, in uh, chapter 14 this evening, Proverbs, in chapter 14, and uh, we'll spend a few minutes there, and then I'd like to look at a couple of scriptures that I think that will encourage your hearts tonight. I do believe that at times we as believers, and sometimes uh, we don't necessarily need discouragement, but we need a little dose of reality, and we need truth, and we need to be challenged about truth and the importance of it. And there are some times as well uh, that reality or is, is uh, not really the way it actually is. What we see as reality is just a temporary life. And things that are, that are temporary aren't really the real deal. And sometimes we get so focused in things that are in this life that the reality, which is eternity, sometimes is overlooked. And sometimes we need to be encouraged about those things to remember why we live and remember that we are eternal. And uh, the, the outcome can never be bad for someone who has eternal life on an individual basis. And so uh, I want to just look tonight, I want to talk about seasons in life and try to offer you a little encouragement. Will you please look at Proverbs chapter 14? And I would like to read verse 13. This is really a verse of the Scripture that is just talking about um, talking about virtues in the life of a believer. And this is a verse that really kind of has its own context, like many Proverbs do. It just stands alone. And so it doesn't need to be read up to or read after. It would help you if you were reading through Proverbs to kind of see that it's, it is in a fitting uh, list of Proverbs. But this one stands alone. I'd like to read it tonight. Verse 13. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. Father, as we look at this truth this evening, I pray that you would help us to find real solace and real comfort. And I just pray, Lord, that the reality of eternity would be our conclusion this evening that it's just so near uh, that that's our hope. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Now, it's interesting because uh, the Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Uh, and that's really, really true. The Bible talks about a broken spirit and how it dries the bones. And so we understand that being merry or having joyfulness in us, we understand that's a good thing. But the word laughter in the Scripture is not always a positive word. In other words, oftentimes we find the heathen laughing. We find the scorner laughing. We find the mocker laughing and saying, ha, ha. And their laughter and their mirth is actually not joy. It's the, the, the source behind it is not that there is a heart of mirth behind it. It actually is, as Proverbs is saying here, it's actually sort of a cover-up for what's actually there. Sometimes it is sort of a, an insult or an assault. You ever met someone who laughed at consequences? They mocked consequences. Uh, rebels laugh, don't they? They laugh at consequences. And when they are given consequences, they laugh in the face of it. They laugh at their own destruction. And there isn't joy behind the laughter of it. There isn't mirth behind the laughter of it. And so I want us to understand our, our uh, context this evening that, that Proverbs is not here necessarily saying that laughter is something we need to have, but it does say that even in laughter, a person who's able to laugh, the Bible says the heart is sorrowful. Heart is sorrowful. Now, with few, with few exceptions, a person can laugh in almost any circumstance. You ever been in a real bad way and found humor in it and actually laughed about it? I have, I have thought, well, I'm in a mess. <laughs> and my natural response is just, well, wow, that's funny. I mean, I can find humor in a bad situation. I do think that uh, that there is a healthy ability uh, or a healthy humility in the ability to laugh at oneself. You ever met the person who can laugh at someone, but they cannot be laughed at? You ever met a pet that can't be laughed at? You ever see a dog or a cat that gets, I mean, they just, 
it's uh, huskies are that way. I think all huskies. You know, huskies laugh a lot. Uh, y'all have you ever seen a husky laugh? They got their mouth open and they're just like, <laughs> that's a husky personality, a dog personality. But huskies don't like to be laughed at. Normally, the ones that I've that I've interacted with, they don't think it's funny. They'll put their head down or they'll make faces at you. But if you laugh at them, they just they just don't think they don't like they like to laugh at you, but they don't like to be laughed at. There are a lot of people like that actually. You ever met the person they can pull pranks on people and they can have fun at people's expense, but you better not do it back to them. You better not. You better you know they can make fun of you, but you better not make fun of them. And they they can't take what they dish out. And so their laughter is exposed a little bit there because their laughter is actually usually mockery or disrespect or disdain more so than it is just humor. And uh, humor uh, gives laughter too, doesn't it? Uh, I, I think, I'm not saying this evening that laughter's bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I do think that a person, uh, for laughter to be appropriately understood in, a, in, a, in the right sense, I do believe that the way to kind of ask yourself the question, what kind of laughter is this? Can you laugh at yourself? Can you laugh at your circumstances? Can you be in circumstances and say, well, it, this is, there's irony here, and be able to laugh at it? Or uh, this is a mess. I'm in trouble. And you laugh about it, not in the sense of I mock consequences, but <laughs> boy, you know, I'm a laughable individual. It, it takes some humility, doesn't it, to be able to be laughed at and to be able to look at your situation and say, wow, you know what, everybody, everybody's right to laugh at that because that's what it is. It's funny, uh, even if it's at my expense. There are seasons in life, though, and I would say that in any season there can be laughter. In any season of life there can be laughter. I uh, have periods in my life uh, I've lived long enough actually to know a little bit about the seasons of life, which is, which is interesting. No one ever feels like they're old. You could, uh, you could be 90 years old, and when I talk to you about how you feel, you still feel like, you know, a young person. Now, teenagers, you're going to realize this. I, I was telling a teenager this the other day. You know, you're like, when you're 18 years old, you are literally like a year from being so not cool and so irrelevant and so never having lived life and knowing anything about it. You know, I... I mean, everybody knows, like, after 18, like, you may still be a teenager at 19, but you are so out of touch with life. I mean, you just do not know what everything in life is all about, like you do when you're 13 or 14 or 15. And so, uh, you teenagers, you're going to know, actually, that you will not feel a bit different inside, but you will have passed a season of life, at least from the way other people perceive you, and you'll be looked at differently. Uh, I uh, remember for a lot of my ministry just being so frustrated by the fact that people oftentimes initially judge your ability to lead or uh, your, no your, your uh, knowledge of the Scripture by your age. And the old preachers always said this to me, and I found it's very true. They said either you're too young to know anything or you're too old to be relevant, but you're never the right age in the ministry, and that's really I found is that's not true. That's not true with godly good people that are, that uh, have discernment, but it is true oftentimes with uh, people that are cynical and that uh, don't want to hear truth. And if you try to preach truth to a young person who doesn't want to hear it, you're too old to understand. And if you try to preach truth to an old person that's uh, that's needs to hear it and needs. Uh, needs needs the truth that you're too young to know anything, and that's kind of the way you received. Of course, that's from a negative perspective, and that isn't always the way it is. But I have lived some seasons in life. Uh, it it uh, humors me a little bit to consider that I'm middle aged, uh, middle aged, and uh, so that's it's funny, isn't it, Mrs. Dollins? I'm just a kid, right? <laughs> yeah. just a, thank you. Uh, I'm just a kid, but the reality of it is, is that you know these chest pains in my side are belying my uh, upcoming heart attack, which tells me I'm a middle-ager. I always say things like that to make my wife make faces. <laughs> One of these times I'm going to keel over while I'm preaching and it won't be so funny. For you anyway, I might laugh. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that the, the seasons in life do come and go. And, uh, 
you, know, you hit a certain age when you don't just say, no, I better not do that and then do it anyway when it comes to athletics and things like that. But there's a certain age when you say, I better not do that, and you actually don't. And I have received far fewer injuries once reaching that age in my life than I did before that. My wife said there was no way I was going to be uh, 30 without being permanently in a wheelchair. And that was like when I was 22 or 23 years old. And she said, you're going to be in a wheelchair forever by the time you're 30. And I was already in a wheelchair a lot <laughs> by that time. <laughs> and so and she's like, you need to stop. You're not a kid. And you need to quit trying to do things that uh, kids can heal from, but adults can't. And so <laughs> anyway, uh, but I've seen some seasons in life. And I've also realized uh, that you have times of life where you look back on. And there are times that you look back on where maybe things are a little bit bittersweet. And you look back at, at times and you just remember how good those times were. Uh, let me give you a, a for instance. I think, um, I think that for me, and probably for Melissa too, some of the best time in our life was when we first met each other. And it, was, it, it wasn't only because we met each other. I know for her it was. But for me, there were other things that were good about it as well. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the reality of it was that God was just really doing a lot in our lives at that time on an individual basis. And what he was doing in our lives actually brought us together. But today, uh, we get calls from people. Every now and again, Melissa will say, guess who's here? And we'll just talk about our, somebody has stopped by our house or guess who's on the phone or whatever. And somebody will call, and there'll be someone that's serving the Lord in ministry today. And they're usually one of our young people from that couple of years, right there, uh, around 2000, 2001, 2002. And just the Lord just gave us such a fruitful ministry with people at that time. We saw so many people saved, and we saw so many people grow, and young people end up just making like 180 degree uh, d directional changes in their lives from literally being on a path of destruction to God getting a hold of their heart and the next thing you know they're serving the Lord and they're still serving the Lord today and I look back in that time period sometimes when I get to go back uh, it's not far from here but we were we worked at West Park Baptist Church in Delray Beach and sometimes when I get to go back there for one thing or other maybe to preach or to do something sometimes I'll just sit in the auditorium if I can alone and I'll just think and remember of all the things uh, that I just saw God do there in that place. And it's just, just a sweet time in my life, sweet memories. And I even remember the people and just different things. And it just seemed like every day God just did massive, majorly big things in my life. Um, I can remember when we started our church, you know, in 2006, we didn't come up with the idea of let's start an independent fundamental Baptist church with distinctives like uh, like we believe in the authority of the scripture and uh, and you know we uh, hold to really the the standards of the faith and the Baptist distinctives and the things that our church really is defined by we didn't just do that on a whim actually that was like a lifetime uh, vision that God had put in me and, and, and that matched my wife's vision when we came together and got married and we had planned for years, actually, to start a church. And when we started Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, that was like the culmination of not only years of preparation, but anticipation. And really, it was everything we dreamed. It was just, if we look back at it, it's funny because I should probably write a book about all the things that God did uh, for us. We started our church by faith, and, and we just, just took steps of faith. And it was just so commonplace on a daily basis for God to work miracles that it was almost like, um, almost like you just, yeah, of course he did. You know, I mean, God did a miracle today. Well, of course he did. You know, and it was just like that was just that season in our life. God just worked miracles. And I could tell stories about it. And uh, you'd say, wow, that's really neat. It was a real wonderful season of life. There have been seasons... Um, in life that have been seasons of pain, seasons of pain, loss, uh, losing loved ones, uh, seeing believers really go backward in their faith. I want to tell you something, folks. If you think it does not affect your church and it does not affect your pastor when you don't do well spiritually, it absolutely brings a season of pain uh, when, when you go back 
away from the Lord. And when, uh, when we go after you and we pray for you and we plead with you and try to get you to do right and you make a decision uh, to go into sin. And you know, usually it seems like the, those, those people the Lord chastises and brings full circle and brings back. But I'll tell you something, it, it literally makes the heart ache. You know, it just hurts. And those are painful seasons. They're seasons of loss, seasons of pain. And you'll endure those in life. There are uh, sicknesses. Now, for me, I, I haven't had the sickness unto death. I'll let you know about it when it comes. But I haven't had, for me, the major ones. But, man, I've been through it with, with family members and, and uh, with church members. You know, cancer. I'll tell you what, cancer is just, um, it's just such a... Um, it's just so painful just to watch somebody go through the stages, finding out, deciding how to respond, and then the hope and the anticipation, the prayer. Sometimes, man, God just God takes care of God heals. And then sometimes God takes someone home. And you watch that, and it's painful. It's just a season of, of pain. And there are some of those... Uh, 2015 in our church, I've said, was is probably one of the most difficult years of my life just about three years ago. This year my sister went home to be with the Lord. It's the year that like 10 people that I knew personally died. And just just, just people that had grown up with and known. I mean, it was just like when people called and they said, did you hear about it? I just wanted to hang up the phone and say, I don't want to hear about it. I, I can't. It wasn't because I wasn't willing to accept the truth. It was just like there was just such a pain in my heart. You know, and we just sang the song, Does Jesus Care? And boy, I'll tell you, that song was a comfort at that time. It really was a major comfort to know that Jesus cares. And this is a season, but that was a season, you know, that year, 2015, really was a season of pain. We had some people uh, spiritually just not do well that year, and that caused the most pain. It caused more pain than anything else. Uh, and uh, just, just such a season in your life that you actually look back at. I look back at like 2000, 2001, I just, just think of all the great memories. And I think back to 2015, I almost feel the pain again, you know, when you, when you think back to that time. And um, that's life. That's life. My friend, I can't stand the prosperity gospel because it'll, it'll destroy you as a believer. Now listen, you may have your, your day that's a lie of prosperity that's for this earth. But friend, that isn't reality. It isn't reality. Life isn't full of sadness. Life is full of joy. Life is full of times of rejoicing. But my friend, life on this earth ends with death. You know, in a sense, in a way, uh, I've been glad that we're a young church generally speaking, that our ministry primarily has had pretty young people. And I'll tell you why, because a lot of times I talk to pastor friends, and, and what would you do this week? And I tell them all the things that we're working on, the projects that we're doing, and the outreach and so forth. And I ask them, what would you do? Well, I had seven funerals this week. And I just think, I mean, oh, wow. You know, the, and, and that that's some ministry. That's just the way it made Hey, listen, if we, if we don't stay young, we'll get old, right? And uh, if we don't reach young people, we'll become an old church. And we'll, an old church only attracts old people. And young people don't want to go to an old church. And uh, so if we ever do that, if we ever go that direction, then we'll, we'll go to the funeral stage. And oh, that'll be, that'll be painful, won't it? <laughs> you say, Pastor, you sound like a real pessimist. I'm not, because if we have eternal life, we don't actually die. And everything that happens in this life is just part of seasons. God is a very, very orderly God. And you may be a person that just randomly goes through life and doesn't pay attention to order and to things, but God makes things pretty orderly. You know, you may not be the kind of person to go out at night and look at the moon and say it's different. And then realize that once a month, it's full. And realize, oh, God made, God made 12 full moons. That's a year. And God made four seasons. I know you don't think we have four seasons in Florida, but I can feel it when it gets below 70. Believe me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, God makes four seasons in a year. And when God created the heaven and the earth, God made days. He made days and He made nights. And there's uh, really four seasons in a day. There's dawn, there's daylight, there's dusk, and there's night. And God, God made that in that order. And God made uh, weeks 
and weeks are series of seven, and uh, seven seven days, and then there are uh, weeks of seven years, and uh, God really established that kind of order. And so there's there are seasons in life, and all that I'm saying to you is this: you and I could be well served as believers to learn that life has its seasons, life has its times, and laughter is something that belies oftentimes what's behind it as Proverbs 14 13 says it says that even in laughter the heart is sorrowful there's sorrow behind a lot of laughter in other words Proverbs 14 13 is saying oftentimes laughter is cover-up oftentimes laughter is an attempt to cover I mentioned Sunday morning about how that many people who are without the Lord Jesus and do not uh, have the help that comes in, the joy that comes from having eternal life and God's Spirit in them, they're literally going out pretending to be happy. You can go into, uh, I don't, I haven't, ever, you, but you can go into a club. I've had people uh, try to explain to me what the club thing's all about. And I've said, is clubbing fun? And they'll say, oh man, it's so much fun. I just can't stop. It's so much fun. Well, what do you do there? And they say, well, we go and, you know, they don't want to tell me the stuff they do in a club normally, you know. We go there uh, to meet some. What kind of people do you meet there? Uh, clubbers. What do clubbers do? Uh, well, I mean, what do clubbers do? <laughs> what do you do in a club? You know, so, well, it's just, it's really a lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. Is everybody there happy? Oh, everybody's there is happy. I mean, everybody's just ecstatic. I mean... Happy, happy, happy. You know, they're just so happy. And they talk about, and I'll be honest with you, I can't relate very well. People try to tell me what's so fun about it, and I just think that doesn't sound like very much fun to me, to be honest with you. You're not acting like yourself, and you're not, uh, you're not naturally aspirated the way you're acting anyway. In other words, you, whatever you're acting like, you couldn't even act like without some kind of external substance to make you behave that way. And you're around a bunch of people who are all superficial, acting like something they're not. So you're in an environment that's just not real. But the worst thing about it is something that I know to be a fact from every single person who's ever been caught up in that sort of lifestyle. Worst thing about it is that nobody's happy in it and they're all pretending and they think everybody else is happy and no one is. Even in laughter, the Bible says there's sorrow. There's a lot of laughing and there's a lot of mirth. But there's mm -hmm. also a 100% chance that it's cover-up for sorrow. And you know something? Most people have to cover up their sorrow. You know, I, I've said before, you know, if a person didn't laugh, they'd probably cry. And it's kind of true sometimes, isn't it? You know, you, sometimes it's, you realize if I didn't laugh, I'd cry. You know, it's just some kind of response. Sometimes people cry and laugh at the same time. <clears throat> Solomon is not trying to give people a reality check and let them know that, you know, burst a little bubble, let them know life isn't fun and that there's no hope. Actually, actually, he's trying to expose false joy. The end of that mirth, the Bible says, is heaviness. You can go and you can have the good time, and you know it the whole time you're doing it, that's a cover up. And then you know that the end of it is going to be that heaviness. That's depression. That's the Bible word for depression. And the Bible. Uh, very, very, it talks a great deal about individuals that have heaviness. Now, go with me, please, if you will. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Psalm chapter 61. A lot of Psalms that we could look at this evening, but I'd like to look at Psalm 61. And uh, I'd like to talk to you tonight about, uh, actually, I, it should be 31. I, I multiplied times two. I have some kind of a weird some kind of a weird numbers thing going on in, with me. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong about that. Psalm 31 doesn't say what it's supposed to. <laughs> that happens to me sometime and causes me to blush and become extremely embarrassed. About to fall through the floor right now. Let me gather my, myself. Psalm chapter 30. And I'd like to look at verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5. Uh, it's 
speaking of God, the, the psalmist said, For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I want us to understand as believers the difference between laughter, which is a cover-up, and joy, which is a reality. Now sometimes a person can laugh because of joy, but mostly joy doesn't require mirth or laughter. Uh, joy is something that gives that inner peace, that inner contentment, that feeling of blessing that makes it so you don't have to do anything at all to be okay. So you can live with silence, if you will. You watch people sometime. I, I, I observe people quite a lot more than perhaps people give me credit for. But you watch someone sometime, people sometime, and you'll realize some people can't have silence. They can't be still. If they get in their car, they got to turn it up. They got to have noise. If they get home, they got to turn it on. They got to have noise. If they uh, get in a group, they've got to, you know, have life. They got to have activity and action and things happening. They got to have noise. And the reason is because they just can't deal with the silence. And a person who has joy actually can. A person who has joy uh, doesn't need uh, anything when he comes into the fellowship of believers. He doesn't need for a person to think anything about it. You know, some people, I know things aren't very well because they're trying so hard to make me think things are really good with them. You know what I'm talking about? You ever, you ever try? Don't try this with me. Go ahead and try it with me. It's, it's all right. People do it. But they try to let you know that, you know, everything's good. Everything's great. And sometimes they'll even just share extra. Now I just want to tell you how great everything is. And you just think, I wonder what you're covering up. I wonder why you got to convince me. You don't seem to be convinced. A person who has joy in their heart, a person who has God's blessing in their life, they're just okay. They're just all right. And they just don't need that high and the low. They don't need all of the cycles and everything. They just, they're just okay. And uh, they're, they just have joy. And joy is lasting. And joy is real. And it has a real depth to it. And this is David who is really uh, talking about this season in his life and a season really of God's anger. And uh, he said in verse 5, he said, For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Did you ever as a kid, if you had parents, not everybody has the benefit of this, but if you had parents that actually disciplined, that is that they gave you consequences for actions, and some parents gave severe consequences for actions, I would have uh, probably had parents that were normally on the severe side of, of discipline and so forth. But you ever just know it's coming? You ever know you did wrong and you know that you're going to be found out? And you actually thought this, I just wish I could get it over with. I just wish I could get it over with. Because you know the pain's coming. You know the consequences are coming. And you just think if I could just get my consequences, then I could get right. And then I wouldn't feel miserable about it. And it wouldn't be bothering me. And then I could just be okay again. And you actually are anticipating the pain. You're actually saying, even so pain, come quickly so that joy can also follow it. Now do you know something, my friend? The reality of life is that even God's anger for a believer is not the anger of one who would destroy the wicked. It is one who would cleanse or sanctify to, through chastisement the righteous. And friend, even God's judgment in our lives for a believer, even His chastisement is something that is going to bring, following it, joy. You and I as believers ought to realize that we don't need all of the external laughter and the mirth and all of the carrying on. You know, sometimes I think when you go to the church house and everybody's trying so hard to act happy, I just think, I wonder what they're covering up here. I wonder, you know, I mean, the guy can't possibly have his face glued into a smile like that. You know, I mean, a guy ought to be happy, but for crying out loud, you're superficial. It's like really, really evident. It's like, how's everybody doing today? You know, it's like, come on, man. You know, I know you're not happy. You know, I know you're covering something up. I know you're fighting at home or something's going on behind the scenes because you're covering up for something. And you don't have the joy that comes up, you know, that, that comes. And you watch people, 
and it's almost like they're all just looking around and they're just trying to, you know, let people know how, how jazzed they are, how happy they are, excited they are. And friend, if you have uh, joy, it isn't really like that. But when God's judgment comes, the Bible says there's something that does come that is really a breakthrough. And the Bible says in, in His favor, speaking of God, is life. And then it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Now I've looked at this and I've asked myself the question, is this an allusion to the truth that though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day? And I don't think so, actually. I found that to be very true. I found that a morning always brings a fresh perspective. Let me help you something with something. If, you haven't, if you've never been taught or learned any self-discipline at all in life, let me just teach you something that will uh, just give you an adjustment. First of all, you can't be well if you're tired all the time. And I don't care what you do, but if you're... If you're not tired, you don't feel good, and you need to sleep at night. Now, I know you say, Pastor, this is elementary. You'd think so, but it actually isn't because I know a lot of people that only sleep when they can't do anything else. In other words, when they can't stay awake, then they sleep. But they don't sleep on purpose or sleep with purpose. Try doing this sometime. I've heard had people say, and I know that there's a degree of personal or personality to this. I've had some people say, you know, I'm just a morning person. And I've had some, heard some people say, well, you know what, I'm really, not, I'm a night owl, you know. And here's one thing I found out. I found out that if you get a night owl up at 4 a.m. for a couple days in a row, he won't be a night owl anymore. Just get him up at 4 a.m. and keep him moving and working until, oh, I don't know, 11 o'clock. And uh, he'll go to bed. Do it for like 7, except Charlie. Charlie won't. Charlie defies... This is kind of true about you, isn't Charlie? Except for Charlie, but there's something about Charlie that's undiagnosed. And so we don't really know why it is. But the reality of it is, is that if you have to get up every morning at 4 a.m., you won't stay up every night till 4 a.m. eventually. And I found something else out. Um, if you make a morning person stay up until 3 a.m., he won't get up at 4 a.m. You say, Pastor, this is brilliant. Give me some more. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> I found out that if you if you get a system to your life to a certain degree as much as you can with not being selfish and making so your schedule makes it so that you're not good for anything or anybody because it's just about you. It's only internal for your reason. But you, you, if you just live within reason. I found out that uh, if you... Go to bed at night, get up in the morning fairly consistently, all of a sudden you feel better. Some of y'all don't even know what that means. You don't know what I'm talking about. You ought to try it sometime. Go to bed at night and get up in the morning and you'll feel better. You'll find out that you might require nine hours of sleep, but that if you sleep well, you might only require five to seven. And just make a difference in how much you sleep. Just by doing the same thing every night and... Uh, having a degree of consistency about it. And you'll find out something else. You'll find out that when you get up in the morning, the problems that were so overwhelming the night before may not be solved when you get up in the morning, but you'll have a completely different perspective on it. In other words, the inward man will be renewed when you get up in the morning, and all of a sudden, God will have given you the patience to, to live another day. You know, a lot of people won't go to bed until they can figure out how they're going to make it tomorrow. I just don't think I can... I, just, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And the Bible says not to take thought in that way for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. And if you'll go to bed, you'll get up in the morning, and, and you may not have the answer about what you're going to do, but you'll, instead of saying, I just can't make it, you'll be like, well, I guess I can make it another day. And you know what will happen? The morning will come eventually where there's joy. Because that morning is a season. It's a season of life. And first, sometimes in our lives, when we're going through the process of going from being in total juxtaposition from God, just opposites of God, then God will judge us and we'll go through that time of, of uh, sorrow and mourning and we'll go through that time of darkness where it seems as though, you know, it's just, God, where are you? Are you, are you here? Are you? And then all of a sudden you'll come to the time of the morning. And you'll have that season of the morning and Man, there's joy in the morning. If you ever get up in the morning, some of y'all don't know this happens, but that's when the sun comes up in the morning. And if you ever get up in the morning and uh, and get uh, time alone with the Lord, and even 
you know, try this sometime. Try going outside and uh, just be doing something and, and, and just see the beauty of the day. Man, there's just a beauty. Uh, uh, there's beauty in everything that God's made in spite of the curse. But there's just something about getting up in the morning when everything's right and you're in fellowship with the Lord and you've been restored and the sun is brighter and the sun's, sunrise just has new colors and there's just it's just a new day and there's a joy that comes with it and there's an anticipation that God's going to do something and that the future is bright let me ask you a question on a, on a reality basis practically speaking is the future bright for us yeah. throw some things out there what are some good things that we can anticipate before we even die before we ever go to be with the Lord or before the Lord Jesus comes what are some things we can anticipate that indicate that the future's bright Someone gets saved when you witness to them. Yeah. You know, statistically speaking, odds are you preach the gospel, people are going to get saved. It's a reality. You know why fewer people get saved uh, than, than uh, have it sometimes in the past? Because we just preach the gospel less. You preach the gospel more and more people will be saved. And when people get saved, you know what happens that's coupled along with that? They get the Holy Spirit of God living in them. And when the Spirit of God lives in a person, then He teaches them things, and they get in the Word of God. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of responsibility we have to help along with that. But all of a sudden, God changes them. There's just something about someone having their lives changed that brings hope, isn't there? You know, no one is beyond hope. No one who is living and breathing is beyond hope. I have seen people who are on the verge of literally losing hope their minds like literally I'm not saying that facetiously I mean just literally losing the ability to even identify who they even are they don't even know who they are and I've seen the gospel change them there's a guy I'm praying for right now I can't figure out if his name is David or if his name is James because he tells me something different every time I meet him but he wanders up and down Oakland Park Boulevard and if you're not talking to him he's usually screaming out and and uh, and uh, punching the air and so forth and doing different things and so if I go up to him though and I'll say, what are you doing to him? He'll be like, oh, sorry, sorry, what's the matter? You know, and then I can have a real conversation with him and he's, his, his mind's there, but he's very nearly gone. He's very nearly gone. And I'm praying for the Lord to save him. Every time I talk to him, I try to share the gospel with him. And I've gotten a little further every time. And uh, you know what? God can just give him his mind back. He can get his mind back. That's what, I mean, only God. I mean, if the government gets a hold of him, they'll give him medication, and it, that'll be it. He'll never have his mind again. But if God gets a hold of him, he'll get his mind back, and you won't recognize him. You'll say, "There's no way that's the same guy." It'd be like the maniac of Gadara. Yeah. He'll get in his right mind, and you know something that that a reason for hope, isn't it? If you're breathing, you've got hope. God can do things. You you may have loved ones or family members, and I mean, it just looks as though the things that they need spiritually, it's just never going to happen. And my friend, they're living and they're breathing, and it's amazing how many of us could testify and say, I'd never be in the church house. I'd never be in this place. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been insulted by believers who have said, you know, I never would have thought there would come a day when I'd hang around Pastor Price. You know, and they don't mean that in a nice way. They're like, you know, he is a fuddy-duddy, he's no fun. He's, well, by the way, that's not true. I'm loads of fun. You just got to hang around me, folks. <laughs> they think, oh, you know, he doesn't know how to fun, have fun. He doesn't, yeah, da, da, da. and I can't believe I'm in this place. But they say, but God changed my heart. Man, I... Now he looks like he's fun. Yeah. And they think there's some kind of a veil has come over their eyes and they're spiritually blind to boringness or something. I don't know what it is. But anyway, folks, joy comes in the morning. There's a season for joy. And it's, and it's, it's a season that's coming in your life. And in the same way that laughter is covering up sorrow and mirth is covering up heaviness, for a believer, even in times of sorrow, we can still have joy and we can also anticipate those seasons of joy. And friend, I'll tell you, it's wonderful to have a season of joy. 
it's wonderful to be going through it. You know, we've, uh, we were kind of in the summertime here in our church, and summer's a season for our ministry where there's just a lot of outreach and we see a lot of people saved. Uh, it's, like, it's like there's just all of the stuff that the government uh, forces on our kids is kind of let back just a little bit. We go after our teenagers again, and their, their lives aren't scheduled so much where we can actually reach them and, and do things with them, and we end the summer with revival. And the Lord really just works and takes them to, uh, to different levels each year. And, man, that's a great season. It's a great season, our summers in our church. Let me go to one last passage of Scripture, the one I told you about earlier when I was wrong. It's Psalm chapter 61. And uh, this is God's promise of blessing, future blessing when, when He restores, of course, uh, Israel and, and when He does things among the nations. And listen, listen to this because um, Israel today is a people that aren't a people. In other words, they're a nation that is that is only surviving because of their because of God's providence. That is, they're not God's people. Uh, they they are the ones that the Bible says say they're Jews and they're not. Not because they're not ethnically genetically Jewish, but because God isn't their God. And so uh, a lot of Christians make a lot or, or really become anti-Semitic about national Israel. And uh, the reality of it is is that it really doesn't matter at all what's going on. Now, I don't want to be on the wrong side of things with people that I know God, God has a plan for and also people that God is saving even today. But uh, So I don't want to be on the wrong side of things with them. I'm for national Israel, and I believe they have a right to live and uh, to, to have a nation and, and to not be hunted and killed for being called, uh, being descendants of, of Israel. And so having said all that, though I will say that the nation that God does uh, that God has a future plan for that 144,000, the 12,000 of the 12 tribes. That's a future event. And God doesn't really need, uh, I don't mean to say this disrespectfully, but He doesn't need the, the uh, war of 1967. He doesn't need 1948. He doesn't need the things that happen. He doesn't even need, and I'm thankful for it, but He doesn't need Donald Trump even to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Now, I think that's a good decision. And it's, it's been very, very deceptive of our nation to not stand with our ally in that way. But God doesn't need that. In other words, the na national Israel can be dispersed abroad, and God knows everybody who is a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and God can bring them back together. The nation that God's going to set up is going to be different than that nation because God's going to be the head of it. God is not the head of Israel today. Is He? Is God the head of Israel today? No, He's God, just like He's the God of every wicked person. But God is not a theocracy, trust me, folks. Uh, the, the, the sin, the wickedness uh, in, in Israel today rivals any country in the world. Did you know that homosexuality in Tel Aviv has the highest per capita of any city in the world? Did you know that more Jews practice the occult than any other ethnic group in the world? More Jews are into Satanism than anything else. Well, that's a fact. You know, they're not God's people today. And I'm not speaking anti-Semitism here tonight. I love God's people, the Jews. And they can be saved, but God's future plan for them isn't what's happening with Israel today. That's all I'm saying this evening. And so I'm not concerned uh, that somehow God's plan can be thwarted by uh, the nation being disbanded because God can set up a nation in a day. He can set up kings. When God says, hey, y'all come over here, and they flee to their God, and they're pursued by the wicked around the world. Listen, my friend, it's going to be a different scenario. It's going to be different uh, than what's happening there today. And they will have turned to their Savior. They'll have turned to the Christ that they looked upon, and they will have received the one with the nail scars in his hands and the wound in his side. And we're speaking of those days in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 7. The Bible says, For your shame ye you shall have double, and for confusion... They shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Now, how do you like that phrase? Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, uh, have, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. 
Now I want to go down to, to the beginning of the chapter now. We'll look at the thing that brings these good tidings. Look at verse 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Captive and God's going to set them free. You're, uh, you're brokenhearted and God is going to bind you up and literally comfort you and hold you. And then in verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Even in laughter there is sorrow and in mirth heaviness. But there is also a season, isn't there? There's a season to joy. Verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. Now let's draw our conclusion from that last phrase. That He might be glorified. Yes, yes, Chuck. Uh, I've lost you somewhere. What well, that was verse 3 of, of Isaiah 61. Oh. Did I say Psalm 61? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sorry. I did it on purpose, and I'm glad. <laughs> That's what I mixed up earlier. Okay, anyway, my point is this. And the, the point of the scripture is that now I lost my point. Chuck interrupted me. Just because I gave the wrong text. The Bible says that he might be glorified. Now, my friend, I love, I like the song that people sing from this. I think oftentimes they don't know the context of it. He gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be trees of righteousness, the oil of joy for mourning, that he might be glorified. I love that song. It's a peaceful, beautiful song and all that. But the reality of it is, is that God's glory is with the purpose of joy. In other words, God is able to take anything that this life brings that's a cause of the curse. And you and I oftentimes, when we have seasons in our lives that are part of the curse or response, uh, to our own sin, need to remember what God is able to do with it. I, I love Joseph's testimony. I mean, Joseph's a guy that could just sing that song, couldn't he? Couldn't he? You remember when his brethren came to him after his father died? They said, please don't kill us. We know you're just waiting for dad to die and you're going to kill us. And he said, what do you mean I'm going to kill you? He said, you know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And friend, that ought to be the source of our joy. Listen, there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of degradation, there's a lot of evil, and there are times of hardship. And if you look at them, you could oftentimes say, this doesn't have to be this way, but it still is. And your response to it can be, God gives beauty for ashes. Instead of mourning, God gives the oil of joy. The oil, what a beautiful picture that is, the oil of joy. What does oil do? Well, oil just makes things work together without the grinding and the grating and the, uh, you know, it, it lubricates things. And it's just such a beautiful picture all through the scripture. Of course, oil is the picture, is, is picture illustrated by the Holy Spirit of God. God gives that for mourning. He binds up the broken heart. Broke, your heart's broken, what's it mean? He puts your heart together and binds it up. Probably all of us have or will have our hearts so broken at times that we think is just never going to come back. I mean, do you ever do you just feel like your heart just broke? I'm talking about, you know, broke, broken heart like it, some kind of a picture. I'm talking about you really feel like it broke. You felt like, man, this thing, doo, you know, just got broken. And Laos says God binds it up, ties it back together, puts it together. And, uh, and he gives it, stop it. You're distracting everybody. Sit up straight and no more of it. Okay, the Bible says the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. My friend, you and I need joy. We need it for our own sake, but ultimately, what do we need? We need God to be glorified. And the circumstances of your life can be for the glory of God. I remember, uh, and I need to stop storytelling, but I remember uh, going through a very, very hard time in my teen years, and 
just because of our family was going through a real struggle at the time. And I remember my pastor saying to me, saying, you know, God's doing this. You're, you're going through this in your life for a reason. Someday you're going to look back and you're going to know what God has done. He's going to use it in your ministry. And I remember just saying, huh, when he said that and thinking, you know what? Okay, good. And I remember that helped me as I went through the time. And since then, those events have been used in my ministry I don't know how many times. And God does those sort of things. That's the kind of God he is. So my question is this, your laughter. Your laughter, what is it? Do you have the habit? Do you need it? Is it a cover-up? Your mirth, what is it? And the real question is, are you in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 Christian? Where God has taken what's evil and He's made it to be good. Do you have that oil of the joy? Do you have your heart bound up? Do you have the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness? Because if you do, God can be glorified. We're going to live our lives for the glory of God. That's why we need to be what we ought to be. And so I hope that's a help and encouragement to you this evening. Sometimes it's just good to know that life isn't all a bed of roses, but that it still can be the glory of God. Isn't that great? Because that's reality, and it will help you to live it. Father, thank you for this season. Lord, we pray for the seasons that are coming for us, and we will respond your way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your attention. Frank's right on time. You're dismissed.